Thank you, Jim. That's uh, quite an introduction. And uh, I have been coming down here for the last several years, and every time I seem to come down, uh, there's a cold spell here. <laughs> so everybody yells at me for bringing the cold with me, but it was 11 degrees in New Hampshire this morning, so 60 felt quite nice, actually, to me. But um, let's see if this is working. Uh, I have been working with remote sensing for, for uh, I guess, a, a long time now. And this, this talk is really about mostly on remote sensing, not so much the harmful algae. You've probably heard a lot about harmful algae. I will be talking about some of that, but it's really about this um, technology of remote sensing. So just to, what is remote sensing? It's the acquisition of information uh, without making contact with it. And when we talk about remote sensing, we're really talking about observing a planet like Earth. This image on the left is of Lake Erie. And the image on the right is of Jupiter. So we can, it's really about making planetary observations. And the advantage of remote sensing is that you can uh, make these large-scale synoptic views of these hard-to-reach places repeatedly. So you get a lot of information that you really can't get in any other way. The, the uh, origins of the Remote Sensing Earth Observation Program really go back to the 1960s with the NASA Apollo Program. And this was a photograph taken in December of 1968. And this was, uh, this just was the 50th anniversary of this picture, actually. This probably is the very first uh, remote sensing picture of Earth. And it was this picture, some of you may have seen this uh, when it happened, or seen it since, but it was these pictures that inspired um, scientists and engineers to put planetary sensors on satellites using NASA technology to look at the Earth, because this gives you an amazing view of Earth. And uh, back then, this is the population of the planet was three and a half billion people. And now, 50 years later, there are many satellites orbiting the planet, making a variety of measurements on a whole suite of properties listed here on the left. These are, this is an animation of current NASA satellites in orbit. And this is approximately what their orbit paths are like. And I want you to just keep the orbit paths in mind because we're going to come back to this at some point in the lecture. And these are the names of the satellites. The Earth population has doubled in the last 50 years. And it's more important than ever to make these measurements to monitor how the Earth is changing as we put stresses on the resources of the planet and also as the climate is changing, and it's changing these properties. And all of these, what we've learned is all of these properties are linked together. So if you change one thing, it has a ripple effect. So it's really important to make these observations. And satellites are the really only way to measure uh, the planet and see how the planet is evolving. The types of uh, satellites and the products that we're going to look at today are really looking at the algae that are floating in the water. And this is an image taken from one of these satellites that is looking down. And uh, you see this phytoplankton or algae bloom off the coast of North Africa. And you can see the discolorations in the water. And what this is really measuring is uh, the chlorophyll in the water, which is directly linked to how much algae is in the water. Chlorophyll is measured from these sensors called ocean color sensors, because really what we're measuring is the, the light field coming back off the planet. So this is really looking at, what you're looking at is a composite of the light coming back. That was one image, but the advantage of taking repeated images over uh, many, many months and, and years is, is a movie animation like this, which gives us a view of the planet that's really impossible to get any other way. And what we're looking at here is the 
concentration of algae in the world's oceans over space and time. The blue colors are low amounts of algae in the water, and the green are really high amounts of algae. And you're seeing the imprint of light and nutrients because that's what makes algae grow. So this is really the response of algae to how light and nutrients are being distributed across the planet, which is also a function of how the, the water moves in the seasons of the planet. Phytoplankton, or algae, are these single-celled organisms that float in the water, and they photosynthesize. They're basically floating plants, and there are thousands of different species out there. If you were to add up all the phytoplankton in the water, or the algae in the water, right now, they would account for about 1% of all the plants on the planet, including trees and grasses, all, everything on land. But they have such a short turnover time. They only have a lifespan of days to weeks. And if you look at the annual total, they account for about half of all the plants on the planet. So what that means is they're taking up as much carbon dioxide and producing as much oxygen as the land plants do over an annual cycle. So they're really critical to uh, these uh, planetary cycles of carbon and these other elements. And as we talk, you hear about things like global warming and carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere. The algae in the water and the oceans are really important to that process. They have this capacity to take up carbon dioxide because they're, they're plants, so they photosynthesize and which means that they're producing food, their own food, and growing from light and carbon dioxide. So they have something called chlorophyll A, which all plants have. And this is what makes, this is a pigment that is used to collect light. And it, what, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that makes trees and grasses look green. So when something looks green, it's because of this pigment called chlorophyll A which is what plants use for photosynthesis. And it's used to intercept light, and it directs it into what's called a reaction center, and they use that to ultimately um, split water and uh, make carbon and give off oxygen. But plants and these algae have also have different pigments in their system to help collect light as well. Chlorophyll A is green because it absorbs blue light and red light. So the colors that we see is, are, is, what, is the light that gets reflected back to us. And light is composed of this uh, as a rainbow of colors. So when you are looking at something and you see a color, like a red, this red jacket right here, it's not that you're your jacket is red because that's what's reflecting uh, the red color back. It's absorbing those other colors. So what we see is what's reflected back to us. So plants and algae look green because they're absorbing blue and red, but they have these other pigments which, makes, which they use for photosynthesis or to help them in some cases protect them from too much light. And these have different colors. So. In high concentrations, they can really start to affect the color of the water. So this whole technology of ocean color remote sensing is really looking at the colors and interpreting the light field. And this is a dramatic example of uh, these red algae. That This is the, where the term red tides come from. They have this pigment that uh, is reflecting a lot of red light. So in high concentrations, and they're very visible to us. And this is another type of algae that it looks green because they're absorbing a lot of blue and red light and reflecting back green. So this is essentially the principle of why they thought about putting these sensors up on satellites is that we can see and interpret the light field and then we can sort of understand what's in the water. And so I'm going to show a few... Uh, 
I'm going to show a lot of satellite images today, okay? But I'm also going to show a few uh, plots and slides like this that kind of get into some science aspects, just to help you or show you how this uh, satellite technology is working. The light that the satellite sees is what's coming back at it. And what we're really interested is uh, interpreting the light field coming out of the water, which is being affected by all these things in the water. And if you look at the prism over there on the right, uh, light is it's showing what light is comprised of. Blue light, green light, and red light. And all of these uh, colors of light have a wavelength. This is our scientific term, but... If I say wavelength in this talk, I'm really talking about a color. Okay, I'll try to remember to uh, say what color I'm referring to when I say this. But the satellite is essentially measuring the rainbow coming back off of whatever it's seeing. So how these things affect the rainbow is going to affect what the satellite sees. And here's an example of what the satellite might see or what the light field might look like coming off of the water. So what you're looking at here, this is just one, if you were looking at one spot on the water, this is what the light composition would look like. So on the horizontal axis is the rainbow of light going from blue to green to red. And then on the y-axis or the vertical axis is the intensity of that light. And then you see this profile in this plot. So where that peak is, where it says suspended solids, is right about where the green color is. So that's saying there's a lot of green light coming back. So this is how, this is what satellites are measuring, and this is how we interpret these, uh, the signal coming back. There's different parts of this light spectrum that are affected by different substances in the water. That movie loop of algae I showed a few slides ago was uh, looking at the blue and the green light part of the spectrum. There's other materials in the water. You've probably seen some waters that look tea-colored, which is uh, runoff essentially from land. And this strongly affects... It looks tea-colored because it's absorbing a lot of blue light, so it really uh, affects the blue part of the spectrum. Sediments, something like that you might see after a wind event stirring up sediments, or a big river plume looks brown and it affects the red and the green part of the spectrum. And then a dense algal bloom looks green and it affects the far red part of the spectrum. So our job as scientists is to interpret this light field and relate it to these substances, and then do that with satellite images. It's easy, right? So... Here's how we transform light into something like chlorophyll or a chlorophyll product which is analogous to the amount of algae in the water. This is a plot. Again, this is looking at light. We're going to see a few of these. So I'll try to get a little used to it a little bit, but we're going from blue to red. This is the light coming back, and you see a series of curves here. Each curve is one measurement, and they're colored by how much algae are in the water. So this red curve is associated with uh, a lot of algae in the water. The high peaks have low amounts of algae in the water. And that means is they're high, that means there's a lot of blue light coming back. So blue water looks like this, that high peak with low amounts of algae. And as you add algae, the signal goes down because they have chlorophyll A and it's absorbing the blue light, and then you get this, um, also this upward shift of green light coming back. So that's why some waters with a lot of algae look green, because they're absorbing the blue light and they're reflecting at the green. And then we take that information and we transform it by something called an algorithm, which is kind of the magic box. And that's how we convert this light field into something like chlorophyll, which is what we want, and that's, what the, that's how we're knowing how much algae is in the water. Ultimately, that's what we want to know. <laughs> now, algorithm, I said algorithm, and I spent most of my career working with algorithms, so I know what an algorithm is, but when I say algorithm, 
an image may, cert may come to mind in some people's heads. That is, an that is I guess, algorithm. <laughs> when I say algorithm, though, um, we're talking about a transformation from what we measure into a property of what we want to know about. And a bio-optical algorithm, that's what we do, is we develop bio-optical algorithms. This is transforming the light field into these properties like the algal concentration. Like this relationship between blue and green light is a way to get to the concentration of algae. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of how these satellites are operating. And uh, here is the planet. And satellites are put into orbit. And they're up about 500 to 1,000 meters. And if you remember that movie loop of the satellites, they're about in this zone here. We call this a low Earth orbit. The, the uh, space station is um, a few hundred miles below them. If you're using GPS, if you like to use your GPS a lot, you're, you're using satellites that are way out here. And then if you are looking at the weather, uh, if you want to know, especially down here with hurricanes, it's a big thing to know about. The satellites are way out here for looking at um, the weather systems. But all the way in here is where these satellites are. And we call them polar orbiting satellites because they're going over the poles. If you remember that movie loop, they were sort of circling the planet. And this is because as the planet turns, the satellite is orbiting the planet. It takes about 90 minutes to orbit the planet. And it's naturally seeing the whole planet as the, the planet orbits, or the, the satellite orbits the planet. And this is what one day's worth of data collection looks like from one of these satellites. It makes about 15 orbits a day, 90 minutes in orbit. These are passive. There's passive sensors. They're looking at just the light field coming back. And so they can only see uh, the sunlit part of the, of the planet. So nothing on the dark side. The dark side, there was um, this, the, the prism uh, dark side of the moon. Uh, we don't see the dark side of the Earth. Now, what these satellites are seeing is just light coming back to them. Most of the light that's coming back to a satellite sensor is actually from the atmosphere. About 90% of the light that a satellite sees is from the atmosphere. But we don't want that. So we have to do something called atmospheric correction. And what that does, it removes the atmosphere. This is a very complicated procedure. And um, I'll show you a little bit in, the, in another slide or two how this works. Uh, but that's something that is important to know about with these satellite images that we're looking at. 90% of the light is from the atmosphere, and we don't want that. The remaining 10% or so of the light is coming from, and our, we're interested in, the, in what's coming off of the water, so we're looking at the water, not the land. The remaining 10% of light or so is coming from the upper part of the ocean or the lake or the, or the lagoon, and that is the information that we're looking at, all those... Uh, those light plots I was showing earlier was just about light coming off of here. So that's the light field we're trying to interpret and to relate to what's in the water, like these, these algae and these uh, sediments and things like this. Now, the satellites are not measuring every single color. They're only measuring a few colors throughout the whole spectrum. There's no satellite that's measuring the full spectrum. Although the satellite that we're working on with uh, NASA, with these two guys down here, Mike and Jim, that satellite, which is scheduled to be launched in four or five years, will measure the whole spectrum. But right now, we're limited just to maybe between four and 10, maybe 12 positions on the color spectrum of what we're measuring. I'm going to show you a bunch of images that are taking some of those colors and putting them together into one scene. And we call this a quasi-true color. This is how our eyes work. 
we take, our eyes are taking in red and green and blue light and forming one image. And I'm going to show you, we can do this with, a, with satellite data to approximate how our eyes would see something. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of these in a few minutes. Those are not atmospherically corrected. I talked about atmospheric correction. I'm also going to show you these chlorophyll images that do have atmospheric correction to them. So I'll, I'll let you know when we see one, this uh, true color image or a chlorophyll image that has been atmospherically corrected. Here is uh, a true color image. This is what you would see if you were sitting on a satellite. Looking down at the east coast of the U.S., you can see a clear view of Cape Cod and um, the Gulf of Maine. And when we do the atmosphere correction, magically, we uh, eliminate the atmosphere. And what we're seeing, actually, is a chlorophyll image or the concentration of algae. So we've also applied the algorithm. So I've kind of combined two steps in one here. But you're looking at now the algae, concentration of algae in the water. The blue colors are low concentrations, and the greens are higher, and the reds are higher. So you can see the Gulf Stream wall is right here, and you can see how the Gulf of Maine has a lot of red in it, or a lot of, a lot of algae. It's a very rich ecosystem up there, and it used to be, support a huge fishery. Let me just do that again. True color image, and then take away the atmosphere, apply an algorithm. And this is the information that we are interested in uh, as scientists studying what's going on in the ocean, or a lagoon, or a lake. This is sort of a busy plot, OK? So this is one of the only, the, the, I have two busy plots, and this is one of them. This is a table of different satellite sensors that are currently up there. So there's more than one. There's multiple satellites. And what you're looking at is each row is a satellite. And here again is the color of the spectrum that they measure at. So each one of these boxes is, I use this myself, actually, to figure out what satellite data set to use for a given application. But this is showing where they're measuring uh, along the spectrum. And this over here on the far left shows you how small of an area they can see. There's three criteria or three characteristics of these ocean color sensors that are important and have trade-offs. The spatial resolution, how small they can see something. The spectral resolution, where on the, the light spectrum they measure. And then the temporal, which is the revisit time, how often they come over your area, which is tied into this spatial resolution. Up until now, or a few years ago, most of the sensors that were in orbit were these global, what they call the global ocean sensors. And they had big footprints. So the smallest they could see was one kilometer. But the advances, there's been a lot of advances in the last five years or so. And now there's these sensors that measure 10 to 60 meters. And these are the sensors that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this talk. But these are the sensors that are going to be particularly useful for studying the Indian River Lagoon and Lake Okeechobee. And so this is going to be very uh, important, I think. Uh, it's opening up new remote sensing possibilities for this area of the world. And I'm going to be concentrating on that for the rest of this talk. Now, just to show you what spatial resolution can do. This, I'm going to take you through a sequence of images now, uh, changing the footprint of what can be seen. So this is at 330 meter resolution. That means that's the smallest area a satellite sensor can see. This was the best satellite, or the, this had the highest spatial resolution as of maybe six or seven years ago. You can see it's not, you don't really know what you're looking at. This is a coastal system that we're looking at, but it looks pretty modeled. So we don't really know what the features are, uh, are indicating. But as I step through this, I'm increasing the footprint or the, the spatial resolution of the satellite until we get down to about 30 meters. And this is what's available today. So this came on 
Uh, this became available about five years ago. This is from uh, a NASA satellite called Landsat 8, and this is of the Venice Lagoon. So this would be comparable to something like the Indian River Lagoon. And you can see the detail you can see now with these sensors. So that's why these new satellites are going to be really useful for studying the Indian River Lagoon. But there was only one of those up there five years ago. And so I'm going to, we're going to see this plot again in a little bit. But I just want you to look at this, um, look at these dots here. And this is a time scale. So this is, this is from last year. These are satellite passes over the Banana River last year. And each color is associated with a different satellite sensor. So between three and four years ago, there were two other satellites that were launched by the European Space Agency that had the same resolution as Landsat that, were that are going to be really useful for this system. And basically, if you looked at how often they would come over individually, it would be once a week, once every two weeks, which is useful information. But if you combine them all together and sequence them and use them as like a constellation of satellites, you improve how frequently they come over from uh, once every two weeks or so down to less than four days. So this is the other advance. So it's not only the spatial resolution that has improved, it's the number of satellites up there that are now providing this um, a much better time series or temporal coverage of, of these systems. And now this has enabled virtually any system in the world to be observed for remote sensing of aquatic systems. And is there anybody from New England here? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so a lot more than I thought. Well, good to see everybody. Uh, this is uh, uh, from Lake uh, Champlain in Vermont. And this is from, I'm just showing what you can see now. This was not observable a few years ago, but it is now possible. They have cyanobacteria blooms up in Lake Champlain. And this is a sequence of images. This is true color now. This is that RGB true color showing a, a cyanobacteria bloom in one of the corners of Lake Champlain. They have a big problem up there. And you can see the spatial evolution of the cyanobacteria bloom. So this is the kind of the power now that we can get from these new remote sensing uh, sensors. And we can do the same thing for Lake Okeechobee and the Indian River Lagoon now. I'm going to take you now just through a few of these true color images of the Indian River Lagoon. And this is uh, an image from last year. This is a very, this, this image has 10 meter pixel resolution. This is a 60 mile long image. This is a very, very large image. And I'm going to zoom in and just show you the kind of detail that we can see now. So I'm going to zoom in on that box. This is Cape Canaveral. So that's that same image now, which was now we've gone from 60 to 17 miles across. And I'm going to zoom in on this area here. And so now we're starting to see things like um, boats out there and, pot and pylons and kind of color variations in the, in the Banana River. And this is five miles across. And now I'm going to zoom in on this area here, this little box. And so now we can see things that we've never seen before in, in ocean color uh, images. We see boats, boat wakes, shore uh, waves crashing. All these features now, which actually um, can be a problem for this atmospheric correction, but nonetheless, we can see a lot more detail. And I drew this grid on just to show you what it would be in the past. So each one of these cells here is one pixel for the old satellites. So there'd be one color here, be one color here, one color here. Now the amount of detail is pretty amazing. And we can now, we can do this for, you know, anywhere, as I said. So let's just take a look at the southern Indian River Lagoon. And I'm going to zoom in here on Sebastian Inlet. And 
We see other things now. We see some bottom reflection and we see some channels. This would be good to study for like eelgrass distributions. And this is that uh, same Sebastian Inlet now. This is from last year. This is a sequence of images. And this is the kind of thing that we're interested in. We're interested in not only how it changes, what are the variations over space, but over time as well. So here you can see how, if you look at the, the inlet area, you can see it gets cloudier. You see less of the bottom. So obviously something was happening. Maybe there was a runoff event or a wind event, but it got more turbid. And these are the sort of things that we're interested in looking at. Not only are we interested in what's going on in the lagoon, but you can use these images also to see how they're um, interconnected with the coastal ocean. So this, these are two images here, again. These still, we're still in true color land. And you can see these two plumes leaving the lagoon and entering the ocean. And this, in this one, you can see a greenish plume. So there's a lot of algae leaving the lagoon and going into the, into the ocean. And then in the one on the right, you can see uh, this big tea-colored plume. This is probably some sort of runoff event, really changing the color of the water. And the, um, it's also exporting a lot of material and carbon. So this is, inter this is really uh, useful for looking at how the, the lagoon system is interacting with the, the coastal ocean. So these are the types of things that we can see. And so now I'm, main, I'm working with uh, scientists here at Harbor Branch on various projects in both the Indian River Lagoon and also in Lake Okeechobee. So I've been maintaining uh, this whole satellite archive now, which I've, uh, I've got pretty much up to date of these systems, the northern IRL, the southern IRL, Lake Okeechobee, each one of these systems has these harmful algal blooms. So we're going to start to use these to monitor the activities of these algae over t time and space. And that's, I'm going to get into the, some of this now. OK, um, this is another perhaps challenging uh, slide, but bear with me. You're doing good so far. This plot here is, uh, again, we're looking at light spectra here from blue to red. So what, uh, what is being measured by the satellite are in these vertical bars. So the two satellites that, the two satellite types that we're talking about are, that are useful for this system, uh, these high resolution satellites, Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2, have four and five channels. So they're not measuring every point along the spectrum. In fact, they're measuring fewer than the global ocean ones. So they're somewhat limited in how many colors they're measuring. But there's still a lot of useful information that we can get out of just these few measurements. And now I'm going to start to talk about images that have been atmospherically corrected. And this is, a, this is a, an image that has been atmospherically corrected. Each one of these. Uh, points along each one of these colors that the satellite is measuring is an image. OK, so each color, it's measuring a bunch of colors as it goes over, as it passes over the Indian River Lagoon. But each color is being measured and saved as a separate image. So there are four images here, because it's not that it's measuring uh, four different days or four passes. It's the same pass. just four different colors. And it's that combination of the colors. That's how we interpret. That's what we need to interpret to understand what's going on in the water. But I am just now going to show you a bunch of images that are just showing this green light. OK, so uh, this particular image here is the intensity of green light coming back. And that is directly proportional to how much uh, how many particles are in the water. So in this scene, you can see off the coast, it's red and, and yellow. So there's a lot, of, a lot of particles in the ocean relative to what's in the Banana River. So something was going on in the ocean that day. But we're interested in the Banana River. So this is what uh, I worked for uh, this NASA science team, the MODIS science team, and the, 
the program manager, his name was Wayne Asayas, and at our science team meetings, he would always, he'd always look around the table and say, all right, who's got some hot science? Okay, so this is hot science right now. I just made these in the last couple of weeks. The top row is this, a sequence of true color images from all those satellites, from those three satellites that I mentioned, the two Sentinel-2 satellites and Landsat-8. The bottom row is the atmospherically corrected images, but just looking at the intensity of green light. So what this is showing here, this is from last, goes from February to April. You're looking at some sort of bloom event that happened in the Banana River last year in February through April. And this shows you the, the yellow colors are more intense particles in the water. So you can see it got more intense. One thing to note, it got more intense like in the middle of, uh, in the middle of March. But you also get to see that where the bloom is starting and how it sort of evolved over space and time. So it started up here in the northern part of the Banana River and then it started to spread out and then it's by the end it decayed. But it shows you there's a lot of information there that is tied into the ecology of the, of the algae as well as the water currents as well. These satellite images are best used when you have other measurements in the water like buoy measurements or direct measurements but, uh, from cell counts, for example. And so I'm showing here one spot where this red dot is is where there was a buoy. And I got this data from Chuck Jacoby. The top plot, we're looking at time now. This is that time sequence going from February to March. The top plot is the uh, chlorophyll measurement that the buoy was making, which measures every minute or so. The middle plot is from cell counts. People would go out once a week to take a water measurement and see what was in the water, count cells. And then the bottom plot is the satellite measurement at, that, at this point from all those clear satellite images. And you can see that they sort of all agree. There was a peak of green reflectance in March. There was a peak of chlorophyll activity in the, in the buoy. And then there was this uh, peak of cell counts in the same period. The images on the right were taken from a plane, so you can really see the discoloration in the water relative to the ocean offshore. So we know there was something going on in the water. We know that these high reflectance areas were uh, from this algal bloom that was going on. So that's really the power of remote sensing. It, it gets amplified when you can tie it in with what other measurements that you're making with buoys and and directly measuring the water. This is all important because the system has changed. There's many systems changing right now. Whatever, there's going to always going to be phytoplankton in the water. They just will grow everywhere. Where there's light and nutrients, you will have phytoplankton growing. But depending on certain conditions, which we don't really know about, some phytoplankton may outcompete other phytoplankton. And these are not well known, and it's not, it's hard to predict what's going to be growing there because we don't really know what is happening on that microscopic level. Remember, we're talking about a microscopic world here. A fear is that there are phytoplankton that are, prefer to grow in warmer waters, and as the climate is warming up, this may be favoring species that prefer or grow outcompete species at higher temperatures, and this happens to be these uh, toxic phytoplankton in Lake Okeechobee, for example. And so what they fear is that warming, the warming climate is going to sort of favor these uh, blue-green cyanobacteria, not just here, but everywhere. So it's a big concern in, up in Lake Erie, where I do a lot of work. It's a big concern up in Lake Champlain big concern all across Europe and Africa. And what it's doing, it's just favoring their potential growth conditions. So you're expanding 
There's always going to be other, a sequence of phytoplanktons throughout the year, but you may be just favoring or prolonging how long they're there. So it's the satellite images are going to provide a lot of information about detecting that and monitoring that. So now I'm going to shift a little bit to Lake Okeechobee here for the last part of this talk. Um, we've been doing a lot of work out there. This top row, again, is this RGB true color images of Lake Okeechobee from last June. A couple of images from June into July. The bottom row is this atmospherically corrected satellite imagery. And we're, now we're looking at just the intensity of red light coming back. And you can see there's, my, there's a floating algae. Well, these are the cyanobacteria, this, these green streaks. Except in the image here, the green streaks are blacked out. And this is a problem. That says that there's something going on with the atmosphere correction that is having an issue with these algae at the surface. So to help us with that, we need to have other instrumentation out there to validate and improve the satellite data. And so I don't know if you uh, remember this from last year, but uh, Jim Sullivan was on the news in, uh, regarding this new instrument that was put out into Lake Okeechobee, this NASA instrument. And it's this automated robotic instrument does anybody, does this ring a bell with anybody? No? Okay, well, um, last year, an instrument went out. This is basically a robotic instrument, operates on its own. It measures the same thing as a satellite, so it's measuring the light field, but it's right there above the lake. And it's part of this NASA uh, network of sensors. But this was the second one that was put in the lake. The first one was put in the lake... Uh, in Lake Erie a couple of years ago, and it worked so well, we decided to put one in, in Lake Okeechobee. And what these sensors do is uh, they just automatically take a measurement every 30 minutes, just like a satellite would. And what it enables us to do is to compare it with the satellite is measuring. So as the satellite goes over, this instrument is measuring the same thing. So we know what it should be from the instrument and then we can compare it to what the satellite is measurement. We do this all the time. This is called validation. And this plot here, this is, okay, this is another hot science uh, moment, okay? Hot science. The blue curve, this is the spectrum of light that the, we've been talking about. The blue line is what the satellite has been measuring. The green line is what this robotic instrument has been measuring. And right away, we can see they're not the same. They're the same shape, which is good, but there's an offset. So that offset is telling us there's something wrong with the atmosphere correction, and this is what we have to work on. So this is really critical. If we're going to interpret these, this remote sensing data, this is the sort of information we really need. Um, this, is, uh, this is the most complicated figure on the whole uh, talk here. This is from one of these robotic instruments out in Lake Erie. Not only do we use this robotic instrument to help with the satellite, but it can, it's measuring real time every 30 minutes so we can learn what's going on on a much finer time scale than a satellite would. So all I'm going to say about this is the top plot is the, it was a, a measurement from one of these robotic instruments out in Lake Erie where there's a cyanobacteria bloom. Uh, that's the top plot. The middle plot is from a buoy measurement right next to it, measuring turbidity or how much particles were in the water. And then uh, the bottom plot is the wind speed. When you combine all of this information together, you really learn a, a lot about not only what's happening with the light field, but the ecology. This, all of this stuff is tied into, uh, has ecological information about what the cyanobacteria are doing. So it has, in, it will give insights into algal ecology, aside from really helping with this remote sensing. As these new satellites are be becoming to become available to everybody, they're gonna, we're going to see a lot more uses of this in, in all types of systems. This is a plot from a study
from a recent paper that looked at bloom intensity over uh, Lake Erie. And this is the sort of information that you can also get from satellite data. We're talking, uh, this is stretching now from 1984 up to 2014, so decades worth of information. We're not only interested in just the short time scales of how blooms are evolving over days or weeks, we are interested in the long-term signal. This is the sort of uh, information we need to see how systems are changing over time. In Lake Erie, there was some sort of uh, change. The blooms were low. There was some sort of change in the mid-90s, and the blooms came back. And it's been a problem ever since. But this is all based on remote sensing data. So interpreting that remote sensing data and figuring out what this signal is doing is really, really critical. If you're going to start to say, a system is changing because of this, or a system is either improving or getting worse. If you're basing that on remote sensing data, you're really going to have to have this field information to confirm it, which is what that, uh, that radiometer out there is going to help us do. And all of the research right now that I'm doing, we really want to interpret how these images, uh, we want to use them for studying systems and neuroecology. But before we get to that, we really have to work on improving this atmospheric correction component and then working on that algorithm. I, I do play an instrument, so I, I'm practicing my rhythm uh, every day almost. But this is the area that we're really trying to, a lot of the science is done here. And I've spent a lot of time in that little circle working on atmospheric correction and algorithms. And I'm just going to end with a few slides on other remote sensing technologies that are coming online. Just to, you know, it's not just satellites. There are other things that are available as well that will really help uh, observe these systems. There's satellites in the past have been very large. This picture on the upper left is what a satellite uh, one of these ocean color satellites looks like. This is an actual, this was one of them that's up there now. But things are becoming miniaturized. You know, technology is really getting, uh, miniaturizing everything. And now there are these things called CubeSats. Have you ever heard of a CubeSat before? So CubeSats are basically uh, these miniature satellites that are the size of, well, a little radio or something. But uh, this is where the technology is going. So we're going from big satellites down to these very, very miniature things. And they're going to be able to put many of these out there. They're much cheaper. They're easier to launch. And uh, they're going to provide a better coverage of the planet. And the first one of these that had an ocean color sensor on it was launched in November. So there's a prototype up there now. But I think in the next decade, we're going to see a lot more of this. And Harbor Branch's very own Mike Twardowski is, is involved in this CubeSat technology. So he's involved in these projects with CubeSats. Also, there are things, uh, another sensor. All these ocean color sensors that I've been talking about are passive. They're just receiving light. But there are other sensors, such as LiDAR, which shoots a laser beam. So it's an active sensor. But it's still optics. It's still optically based. And what this enables is the light laser penetrates the water column, and it gets reflected back. And it gives you information on the structure of what's the vertical structure in the water. And we just did a study using one of these LIDAR devices flown on an airplane over Lake Erie. And what we're able to see is the concentration of these cyanobacteria, where they are in the water. This is really important to see where they are in relation to how it's an impacting remote sensing and also where to sample and water managers are very interested in where they are vertically because the intake pipes around Lake Erie anyway are at certain depths and they want to know where the algae are vertically because the intake pipes are at the bottom the algae are usually at the top well thank you for hanging out with me for so far so long so far uh, you've made it through all these plots. And uh, just to reiterate what we've looked at here today, it's all remote sensing. There are these new technologies that have come online in the last few years. 
this is going to be really important and I think very useful for monitoring the systems such as the Indian River Lagoon around here. And, uh, but that will never really replace field measurements. It's going to be its best. Uh, you can maximize your information from all these platforms when you sort of combine them together. And I think Florida will really benefit from these. And now that you've been looking at patterns and, and images for the last hour or so, I'm going to give you a pop quiz, OK? <laughs> I want you to look at this image and see if you can detect any pattern in this image. <laughs> I'll let you think about that, but with that, thank you very much for hanging in for so long. <laughs>